when you're getting ready in the morning, when you're exercising, or when you just need a little boost. Download Mindset and listen to your favorite motivational speeches while getting ready for the day. I actually I didn't know what was wrong with me at that point because the symptoms seemed so physical and seemed so brain-based. I was scared, if I was honest. I wouldn't have imagined that as I dove down and began to peel back the onion and unpack all of this, that this was related to overwhelming emotions in childhood. That was not my first path of exploration. My first path of exploration was what is wrong with me? Um, by that time, it's kind of going back on the physical side of things for me. I had had headaches my whole life. I had had brain fog or kind of that, that fogginess, not really feeling like my brain was awake all of the time my whole life. Out of nowhere, as I entered into my 30s, I started to forget my words mid-sentence. Memory issues that I always kind of had now seemed, I seemed to have a really hard time even remembering things that happened last week, for instance. And then out of the blue, I started fainting. So of course I was like, this must be something wrong with my brain. What is it? And when I dove into research, I then met all of this you know, work on epigenetics and the effect that our daily choices and or events that happen to us have on our physical bodies. Diving in deeper, I really understood my nervous system. And now I understood my fainting as the, the effects of accumulated years of living in that dysregulated nervous system. So now that I understood what the cause of it was, which goes into my definition of holistic. Holistic for me not only means honoring our mind, our body, and our soul, the interconnectedness of our being, it also means exploring what for many of us are the deeper underlying imbalances that are causing what we're calling symptoms or even diagnoses or syndromes, right? So now that I understood, oh, for me, this fainting could be a symptom of something deeper, could be a symptom of how I'm treating my body and how dysregulated my nervous system is. So as I began to dive into this research, I noticed something else, how disconnected I was to my body. So once I build the foundation of consciousness that we just talked about, once I began to teach myself how to safely inhabit my body, I began to do some nervous system regulation techniques and tools. The quickest and easiest one that we all carry around with us is around breath work. And I started to tune into how was I breathing? Just checking in with my natural flow of breath. And I realized that like many people who struggle with anxiety, I had a really shallow chest breath. I noticed that sometimes, Tom, when I'm really stressed out, I hold my breath. I actually don't really breathe much at all. And what I learned is each time I do both of those things, either just breathe really shallowly or I'm holding my breath, I'm actually contributing to my anxiety because I'm keeping my nervous system locked in that fight or flight mode. So I learned a new way to breathe. I learned how to use my belly, which was hard at first because all of my posture was reflective of all of this constriction and all of this threatening kind of posture and stance of a lifetime, though once I accessed my belly, I learned that I could learn how to bring, teach my body. So I started laying down. It was difficult for me, so I would begin my practice either right before bed or right when I woke up when I was already laying. And for me, it started with just a small daily promise of five breaths from my deep belly area. For me, putting my hand on my belly physically so I could feel it, um, when it would expand and when it would deflate was really helpful. So that was just a daily promise. Every time, every morning or right before bed, I would put my hand on my belly and just practice, practice, practice. But then, like I said, I wanted to become more aware of how I was using my breath all day long. And then building on that foundation, can I harness my breath all day long when now life's happening and I have the actual things to be stressed out about, right? Can I use my breath to regulate myself in those moments? So it becomes a foundational practice that we can build upon. I struggled to create change just like my clients. And I came to understand why after, of course, feeling pretty shameful, pretty broken. I think a lot of us do. I would start to hear from my clients reflections of that disempowerment right back, hopelessness, helplessness, a belief that maybe I can't change. Maybe this future isn't meant for me. And that was really heartbreaking. What I came to realize is that the reason why we can't change is stored in a very powerful part of our mind 
called our subconscious. So that upwards of 90, 95% of the time that I think is now the cited percentage, right, of our day that we're not really paying attention or that we're in autopilot. And what I've realized is in that autopilot are all of these pathways, right? Neurons that fire together, wire together. If we've practiced pathways, most of us from, from childhood and beyond, we get kind of these ruts, as I call them, in our subconscious. So just to contrast, from my conscious mind, I have insight. I can use my past to break and inform patterns that I want to change into my future. Yet unbeknownst to most of us, we're slipping back into that autopilot and we're repeating those old patterns. And like I said, for many of us, we can feel really shameful and we can feel really broken and wonder why we can't create these changes or maintain these changes over time. So the way out, first and foremost, we want to become conscious. We want to see those patterns. We want to see ourselves operating as what I call our habit self. We want to learn how to consciously become an observer of ourselves. For a lot of us, that's the first practice because consciousness is a, is a practice. It's actually firing up our prefrontal cortex. It lives right behind our, our eyes, our forehead. Um, and a lot of us aren't used to living from that space. The easiest access point to our conscious mind is the present moment. And I like to call, I like to reference using hooks for our attention because a lot of us, we don't, we don't flex our muscle of attention very often at all. We really do have choice. We get to decide what, whom, or where I'm expending my attention in any given moment. Yet for most of us, we're worrying about our past, we're thinking about our future, we're lost in thought, we're somewhere else. So for our entry into our conscious mind, we can use the present moment through one of two hooks. Our breath, we're always breathing. So if we can learn how to flex that muscle of attention and put our full focus onto the act of our breathing body, we become embodied. Now I'm in my body and I'm present to what's in front of me. Another hook we can use is our senses. The senses, what are we seeing? What are we tasting? Can we touch something? Anything that we can do that's senses-based can also be our access point to conscious awareness. The more consciously present we are, the more we have choice. We can begin to create new habits and patterns in this moment. A lot of us, when we're looking to create change, we actually want the people around us to be the ones changing. <laughs> um, so it's kind of the radical, you know, kind of self-responsibility ownership. Um, the conversation I always have around boundaries. Boundaries aren't ultimatums. They're not me pointing some finger at you, Tom, and giving you, you know, if you do this, this will happen. If you don't do this, this will happen. Boundaries are for self-empowerment. So I, I answer and I think about things in the same context, right? What am I looking? What pattern am I owning here? Um, what role am I playing? And how can I create change whether or not you're being an active agent or an active player as well? And sometimes this means being radically honest with ourselves and exploring what our intentions are, what our behaviors are, and how we're participating in the pattern, um, even in the moments where we're pretty much convinced it's not us. Um, so I think a lot of times it's, it's that deep level of self-exploration that can give us clarity on that. For a very long time, I think like a lot of us, I didn't believe that there was much creation that was possible. I thought that, you know, whatever genetics we were born with, whatever circumstances we were born into, pretty much that would unfold and that would become our path in life um, with many things outside of our control. Um, this was, you know, uh, evidenced in the field for a very long time when we used to believe in genetic determinism, that idea that whatever it was we were given, that we don't really change, we don't grow, we don't evolve, our genes are our destiny. And now we understand differently. We actually know that we operate with our choices, meaning what I have gen genes, right, that load the gun, um, and then the things I'm doing each and every day determine how I am in life. I even believe that things such as personality, these patterned ways of being, this is exactly what you and I have been talking about. We could call that our genetic personality or we could really look at that as a conditioned way of being. So when I began to realize that, wait a minute, things aren't as set in stone, 
I began to entertain many new conversations with myself of possibility of change. And I now believe that we actually can create ourselves. We can create our future by beginning to make new choices now.